time now. Your ultimate Jekyll and Hyde revision guide. Stay tuned. You're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Here's what I'm going to cover within this superb video. You can skip to any of these sections by using the hyperlinks within the box below, but I would suggest that you watch this video in sequence as frequently ideas are developed between sections. An old bore who has inexplicably to the modern reader deprived himself of the mildest of pleasures and has very little to say for himself, or an astute, loyal man, who does everything in his power to help his friends and preserve their reputations. Gabriel John Utterson is an interesting character and I'm going to start this video with him rather than the two more obvious big hitters of Jekyll and Hyde. He strikes me as a typical Victorian gentleman, someone unhealthily obsessed, paranoid almost, about his reputation. He seems to want to stifle natural impulses, choosing to attempt to regulate his mind and imagination by reading some dull religious tome every Sunday evening. Look at those adverbs, soberly and gratefully. It is as though the simple functional act of going to bed acts as a blessed release from the trials of maintaining Victorian good order and respectability during the day. For there are hints that Utterson, like Jekyll, may yearn for something more from his life, something more spontaneous, something more dynamic. He can't resist speculating about the zest for life implied by the misdemeanours of others. That said, Utterson remains rational and pragmatic throughout the novel. Dreams aside, he buys wholeheartedly into Victorian ideals of restraint and not burdening others with personal issues. And the importance of making sensible, respected judgments. And so he disapproves of the strange clause within Jekyll's will, which states that, in case of Dr. Jekyll's disappearance or unexplained absence for any period exceeding three calendar months, the said Edward Hyde should step into the said Henry Jekyll's shoes without further delay. This is fanciful, irregular and strange. Respectable wealthy doctors do not, cannot just disappear. And in any case, why would a possible disappearance be formalised within the clause of a will which also bequeaths all property to an unknown man, almost certainly from a different class. Otherwise, Utterson would know him. The adjectives fanciful and immodest interest from the quotation on screen. To come up with silly, unrealistic, impractical suggestions is to distastefully show off, delve in unpleasant fantasy and should be avoided at all costs. Utterson's rationality is not just seen in his dislike of Jekyll's strange will, but also in his interactions with Poole when summoned to investigate the theory that Jekyll may have been killed. Pursuing the idea that Hyde may have murdered Jekyll, he rebukes the trembling butler. Suppose it were as you suppose, supposing Dr Jekyll to have been well, murders. What could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Note the thrice repetition of the word root suppose. Note the hesitating hyphen before Utterson brings himself to use the unpleasant past participle murdered. 
Utterson is hopelessly out of his comfort zone, hence his faltering repetition, and thus is desperate to cling on to reason, something Victorians valued more than anything else, living in an increasingly uncertain world in which traditional religious belief was beginning to be undermined and cities were being perceived as more dangerous than ever. During this same night, Utterson's desperate conventionality is seen when he sharply checks that Paul, a mere servant, hasn't inappropriately opened one of his master's letters to a chemist. One might expect very particular circumstances to override class-defined codes of behaviour. At this point, Paul hasn't seen his master for more than a week, has heard strange restless movements in his laboratory and a voice which clearly isn't his master's. The modern reader is unlikely to even register any indiscretions, possibly inappropriate breaches of trust previously committed by a member of the household. But the fact that Utterson does question this highlights his class consciousness, his conventionality. Even in a crisis, people, especially from a lower class, must know their place and behave appropriately. And yet there is an argument to be made that that silly old pedant, although perhaps in his defence not hidebound, regularly obstructs the course of justice, or at least consistently prioritises the preservation of his friend's reputation above all else. Following the death of Sir Danvers Carew, he takes a police officer to Hyde's house in Soho, but fails to mention that the murder weapon was a stick that he had himself presented many years before to Henry Jekyll. Similarly, after realising that a letter purportedly from Hyde was actually written by Jekyll, he fails to contact the police, instead instructing his colleague and handwriting expert Mr Guess not to mention this fact to anyone. Even after finding Hyde's body, he fails to alert the police immediately and once again imposes silence upon a subordinate. Indeed, given that the novel finishes with the two documents, Lanyon's and Jekyll's, we don't even witness this summoning of the police. And this symbolises the upper class's general detachment from officers of the law and the legal systems. Perhaps Utterson is partly thinking of his own feelings towards the police in his failure to communicate key facts about Jekyll's connections to Hyde. Driving towards Hyde's house in Soho with an officer, he was conscious of some touch of that terror of the law and the law's officers, which may at times assail the most honest. Feeling this fear himself, he would be loath to bring one of his oldest friends into contact with the police unless this was definitively needed. In some ways, Utterson could be compared to Jekyll once again. Both prefer to use their own judgment and take matters in their own hands when it comes to deciding what is right and what is wrong. So where to start with Dr Henry Jekyll? Who appears to have more professional qualifications than the rest of us have had hot dinners. My instinct is to draw comparisons with his famous predecessor in Gothic literature, Victor Frankenstein. Monstrous ego, unhelpfully stinkingly rich, superficially charming, fond of whining, and a terrifying failure to take any responsibility for the consequences of his experiments. But let me rein in my natural instinct and first try to give a more detailed insight into some of Jekyll's good qualities. He is a hard worker 
who clearly achieves an extraordinary scientific breakthrough in his creation of a mixture which can house opposing aspects of his character within separate, visually distinct identities. He has charm, good taste in art, and particularly, but not exclusively, when trying to compensate for Hyde's carnage, can do a great deal of active good. He is affectionate to his friends, even when suffering. And all of us, well, at least I can, can identify with his occasional unwillingness to study. However, however, there is so much to dislike. For instance, he is unbearably smug as he congratulates himself on being able to indulge his baser pleasures without any fear of damage to his reputation. Even worse, he doesn't seem to have any genuine concern about the harm Hyde causes. The only thing which seems to bother him is whether he, Jekyll, will be caught up in any scandal. After transforming back into Jekyll following Hyde's brutish, apish clubbing and trampling of Sir Danvers Carew, yes, there are initially tears and prayers, but these quickly metamorphose into a sense of joy. Why? because he recognises that he is safe and that he cannot be caught. Now he can once again show himself off as the very pink of the proprieties, the most faithful adherent to strict moral and social codes. Now he can fully resume his dreary life. It is notable that Jekyll doesn't even use Carew's name within his full statement. Instead, he creates a strange, abominably self-centred detachment by simply burying the generic phrase that crime within a much longer sentence. Even less convincing is his claim that he should take no responsibility for Hyde's actions. A point which conveniently ignores the fact that Jekyll alone created Hyde, but also creates an all too convenient, all too clinical separation which frequently doesn't hold water, to use Utterson's sceptical phrase. We know the pair share the same consciousness and internal organs, and we also see time and time again glimpses of one seemingly operating within the other. For example, take Hyde's language when asking Lanyon whether he would like to stay to watch him take the chemical. Will you be wise? Will you be guided? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. If you shall so prefer to choose, a new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power shall be laid open to you here in this room upon the instant. Would the primitive troglodyte we have grown to know use such expansive rhetorical questions, calls for reflection and incorporate broader questions about the value of knowledge and opportunity? And at the end of Jekyll's full statement, he writes this of Hyde. His terror of the gallows drove him continually to commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of a person. If Hyde has switched from a person to a part of Jekyll, given that the person has always shared the same consciousness, how can we accept Jekyll's previous claims of a complete separation, and therefore his innocence in relation to Hyde's actions? Instead, I'm left with images of a deeply selfish, immoral man. Yes. I agree with Lanyon's description of moral turpitude, albeit one trapped by his own exacting standards and those of Victorian society in general. 
like the majority of us, he wants to let his hair down and indulge some of his baser sensations. Why shouldn't he be merrily disposed at times and indulge in personal pleasures, even if they are, to say the least, undignified, which may or may not refer to repressed homosexual urges? However, he feels that he cannot, partly due to Victorian expectations of gentlemen, partly due to his own imperious desire to carry his head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. And perhaps, given the lack of wives in the novel, due to Victorian's repressive attitudes towards homosexuality. However, the delight he takes in deceiving others and his voyeuristic pleasure in evil make him, in my mind, one of the least attractive characters in 19th century English literature. I previously made the parallel between the self-centred whining egotism of Victor Frankenstein and Henry Jekyll. Might it be possible to draw a different kind of parallel between Frankenstein's monster and Hyde? Well, certainly both are capable of appalling acts of violence, including against children. Both are ostracised from their societies due to their ugly, deformed appearances. and both end up haunting and tormenting their creators. However, whereas Frankenstein's monster was intelligent, initially sensitive, and had the potential to form emotionally enriching experiences, Hyde, as to be expected from an entity composed entirely of evil, delights in the freedom of being able to exercise his inner animalistic urges, apparently free from consequences. After killing Sir Danvers, there was joy within the jewel heart of Hyde and Jekyll. I set out through the lamp-lit streets in the same divided ecstasy of minds, gloating on my crime, light-headedly devising others in the future. This statement comes from Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case, in which he disingenuously tries to distance himself from Hyde's crimes. Yet here we see the use of the first person, which conflates the two characters and confirms that the Jekyll lurking within Hyde is also taking tremendous enjoyment from the fact his separate identity was able to crush Sir Danvers's body so comprehensively. Note the use of the verb gloat, typically used to indicate triumphant satisfaction over someone else or some other group. Do we get a sense here of Hyde and Jekyll sticking two fingers up in the face of Victorian conservatism, of the Victorian desperate need for reason and good order? Meanwhile, the noun ecstasy confirms that the pleasure Hyde gets from the murder is akin to that experienced when intoxicated by a drug, hence the reference to him being light-headed. This extreme hit is addictive and cannot be obtained from natural law-abiding sources. I previously referred to Hyde being ostracised, and this is worth fleshing out, pun intended, in more detail. On the one hand, others recoil when in close contact with him. And this is due to Hyde's phys physiological makeup. However, some modern readers may be more uncomfortable with the universal repulsion felt about Hyde's appearance. He is pale and dwarfish, ape-like, 
in his actions, but there are clearly physical connotations. With a hand, lean, corded, knuckly, of a dusky pallor and thickly shaded with a smart growth of hair. So Hyde appears stunted, hairier, strikingly unhealthy looking. In the words of Greg Boswell at the British Library, he is regarded as physically detestable, but perhaps only because he subconsciously reminds those he encounters of their own distant evolutionary inheritance. During this period, Victorian assumptions about the uniqueness and superiority of human beings were being challenged. In The Descent of Man, published in 1871, Darwin suggested that humankind had descended from a hairy tailed quadruped, which was itself probably derived from an ancient marsupial animal, i.e. something rather like a koala or a kangaroo. Such notions made for uncomfortable reading for the smug, self-satisfied Victorian. And returning to the novel, is there a sense that it is not just the all-pervading whiff of evil which causes other characters and readers to dislike and judge Hyde, but also the fact that he is a visual reminder that human beings are not particularly different to other apparently subservient species? Modern readers living in the 21st century might well feel that to some extent Hyde is being discriminated against and that this might even explain some of his actions. Of course, we can take this argument too far and the link between being discriminated against and subsequently lashing out is far stronger in Mary Shelley's novel and anyway. Can anyone really be blamed for discriminating against a creature made up of stitched, stolen, dead body parts? However, Stevenson's novel does leave us with so many unanswered questions, and one of these is why Sir Danvers Carew chooses to accost Hyde late at night. With the very pretty manner of politeness prior to the latter clubbing him to death. The romantically given, slightly unreliable maid or the third person narrator suggests that Carew might have been only inquiring his way. But this is unconvincing, especially given that he is an MP. And there is no suggestion he was visiting London for the first time. Given the lack of women in the novel, and the evidence of an undercurrent of homosexual activity within Victorian London. It is tempting to speculate that Carew may have been soliciting Hyde for sex, as hinted by the verb accost. This for me is a more convincing idea that he was asking for directions. With this interpretation, Hyde's actions become more understandable, if not justifiable. Why should a younger, more energetic man with a zest for action have any interest in any kind of interaction, sexual or otherwise, with an aged and beautiful gentleman with white hair, even if he was from a higher class, and thus at least according to the Victorian mindset, should be deferred to. In some ways, Hyde impresses. Yes, he has a savage, animalistic temper. But Jekyll himself recognises that Hyde can remain sharp-witted and quick-thinking when under duress. After unexpectedly transforming into Hyde in Regent's Park, in spite of the fact he was lusting to inflict pain, he manages to control himself to write two letters to Lanyon and Paul in the Portland Street Hotel. Ultimately, both Jekyll and Hyde are trapped. The former within the shackles of his own and Victorian expectations, the latter by his actions an ultimate need to defer to another for life. 
This imagery paints Hyde as a kind of devil fetus who nonetheless plucks up the courage and agency to kill himself in spite of his enormous fear of death. Perhaps as readers, we can see where Jekyll is coming from when he finds it in his heart to pity Hyde. So much energy, so much agility, so much defiance living in a world in which far too much attention is paid to doing the right boring thing. But of course, his violence remains abhorrent and genuinely terrifying. Lanyon is another of the respectable professionals in the novel, who is also a bachelor. Crucially like Jekyll, he is a scientist and the pair hold diametrically opposed viewpoints on scientific research. Whereas Jekyll, like Victor Frankenstein, appears to believe in pushing the boundaries of science as far as possible, unchecked by moral or societal concerns, Lanyon believes that research and practice should always be ethical and not threaten established Christian and Victorian principles. For a number of years, their relationship has become frostier due to their different views, with Lanyon snorting indignantly at Jekyll's unscientific border dash and Jekyll dismissing his old school companion as a hidebound pedant, an ignorant, blatant pedant. So for Jekyll, Lanyon is far too unimaginative, bound by petty rules which restrict creativity and unnecessarily confine. Of course, for the re-reader at least, the use of the hyphenated adjective hidebound is deeply ironic, for it is Jekyll, not Lanyon, who is soon to become miserably bound to hide, spelt H-Y-D-E. It is important to note that the first description of Lanyon emphasises his healthiness. This was a hearty, healthy, dapper, red-faced gentleman with a shock of hair prematurely white and a boisterous and decided manner. However, after a strange meeting with Jekyll, which he refuses to explain during his lifetime, his change in appearance is dramatic. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly bolder and older, with a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. The adjectives alone tell the story. Something has caused the transformation from hearty, healthy, dapper, boisterous to pale, bolder and older with a deep-seated terror. And the fact this is not initially explained helps build up tension and contribute to the gothic atmosphere within the novel. However, we subsequently find out that it was Lanyon witnessing Hyde transforming into Jekyll and hearing the latter's explanations which caused this extraordinary deterioration and premature death. There is an argument to be made that Stevenson may be seeking to subvert some Victorian ideals in this novel, particularly the obsessive, claustrophobic focus on propriety, which forces gentlemen to hide inner, often natural, urges. The obvious example of this is seen in the presentation of Jekyll, who finds himself compelled to take the extraordinary extreme step of compartmentalising his identity so that he can pursue his undignified, albeit not particularly degrading, pleasures without any fear of humiliating exposure. But there are hints of double standards throughout the novel. I've already speculated about Sir Danvers Carew's possible soliciting, but it is also tempting to wonder what Enfield, that well-known man about town, had been doing when he came across high trampling on the little girl. Coming home from some place at the end of the world about three o'clock of a black winter morning. Meanwhile, we are told explicitly about Utterson's strange abnegations. No theatre trips, dull religious books on a Sunday night, 
and a permanently watchful eye on his consumption of vintage wines. The novel makes us question the necessity of such endless restraint and caution and illustrates the hypocrisy of a class system in which gentlemen were placed on a pedestal in spite of having exactly the same murky desires and habits as the rest of society. However, returning to Lanyon and Jekyll, the fact that the former deteriorates so desperately and through no fault of his own other than possessing a strict, inflexible interpretation of right and wrong does suggest that Stevenson is not critiquing the existence of a moral code per se. There is a sense that Jekyll, like Victor Frankenstein, has gone too far in his scientific dabbling and that human beings do need some curbs in place, just not perhaps curbs which place unrealistic expectations on men and women and deny natural, legitimate pleasures. Pleasures which Stevenson himself was known to enjoy within Edinburgh, much to his parents' displeasure. Let's now move on to setting and context. In the 1880s, London was the largest city, not just in England, but the entire world. On the one hand, a modern landscape had been constructed in the West End of office buildings, shops, department stores, museums, opera, concert halls, music halls, restaurants and hotels. On the other hand, the East End and areas of inner London, including those neighbouring the West End, were characterised by poverty. There were sordid and depressing living conditions for the poor. And the influx of immigrants, notably poor Jews fleeing persecution in Eastern Europe, as well as concerns about the actions of the poor and a professional criminal class in London, the Victorian respectable classes were also increasingly troubled by the possibility of terrorist attacks. London was, in fact, a prime target of terrorist attacks. In March 1883, the local government board offices were blown up and an unsuccessful attempt was made to blow up the offices of the Times. In October 1883, two underground railways were dynamited. In February 1884, a portion of Victoria Station was blown up. In May 1884, the offices of Scotland Yard were attacked. In the words of Henry James, writing in January 1885, London was gloomy and anxious, and this is the feeling we get from Stevenson's novel. In the strange case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, London seems a chaotic place where the dingy and the respectable are positioned side by side in unsettling ways. For instance, at the beginning of the novel, Stevenson describes a by street in a busy quarter of London which shone out in contrast to its dingy neighbourhood like a fire in a forest and with its freshly painted shutters well polished brasses and general cleanliness and gaiety of notes instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger the simile of this by street being like a fire in a forest is a striking one and suggests the most enormous contrast pleasing Victorian brightness, warmth and life in amongst much darker, indiscriminate gloom. However, there is a court within this street in which a certain sinister block of building thrusts forward its gable on the street. The door to this building was blistered and disdained with additional damage caused by tramps and children. This was the door used by Hyde to obtain the pacifying check of £100 after trampling on the little girl. Within these descriptions, we have a by street in London, which seems nice, but is surrounded by depressing dinginess and presumably poverty. 
However, even within this nice street, there is unloved decay and malignity. And this symbolises the confused, muddled nature of London, in which the privileged classes live disconcertingly close to the hungry poor. And remember, there was a lengthy economic depression from 1873 to 1896, which caused a great deal of suffering. We subsequently find out that the sinister block of building in the court actually contained the back entrance to Jekyll's house, which is described in the second chapter of the novel. Unlike neighbouring properties, for the most part decayed from their high estate, this house was occupied entire and wore a great air of wealth and comfort. And so Jekyll's house and Stevenson's description of London as a whole symbolises the fact that good and evil and all intermediate stages are intertwined and inexorably linked. They cannot and should not be artificially separated, in spite of Jekyll's protestations and actions. Through his symbolic descriptions of London and Jekyll's house, Stevenson is questioning Jekyll's claim that... It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots of good and evil were thus bound together. No, it is entirely natural and normal for good and evil to be bound together. What is unnatural is failing to recognise this and creating a chasm between parts of both our individual and collective identities. Houses cannot be broken in two. And so individually, we must accept our imperfect identities and society should not stand in the way, notwithstanding the importance of certain curbs to maintain social order. Within a modern world, different classes cannot be housed within wholly distinct streets and areas. And so collectively, why should class distinctions be valued so highly, given that all humanity share the same human desires and characteristics Yes, even gentlemen, and have to swim along together anyway. Elaine Showalter, within her excellent essay, Dr. Jekyll's Closet, goes one step further when exploring some of the descriptions of London and Jekyll's house. She writes, Hyde travels in the chocolate brown fog that beats about the back end of the evening. While the streets he traverses are invariably muddy and dark, Jekyll's house with its two entrances is the most vivid representation of the male body. Hyde always enters it through the blistered back door, which in Stevenson's words is equipped with neither bell nor, nor knocker and which bears the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. Is it too much of a stretch to suggest that these images are suggestive of anality and anal intercourse, as she proposes. I am nearly convinced, actually, given the insistent striking landscape of bachelorhood and the amount of unexplained late night wanderings around London, those reading the novel for the first time without knowing that Jekyll is Hyde may well speculate that the two could be in a compromising homosexual relationship an idea reinforced by the imagery of London and Jekyll's house. Whereas the suggestion that colours used to describe fog are potentially suggestive of excrement and the anus is contentious, the overall idea that Stevenson's London is murky and smoggy with poor visibility is not. When taking a police officer in a cab to hide Soho House, Utterson beheld a marvellous number of degrees and hues of twilight, for here it would be dark like the back end of evening, and there would be the glow of a rich lurid brown like the light of some strange conflagration, and here for a moment the fog would be quite broken up, and a haggard shaft of daylight would glance in between the swirling wreaths. Later on, as Utterson ponders the strange death of Sir Danvers Carew, and Jekyll's strange connection to the murderer. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles. 
The imagery here is striking, particularly the reference to London as drowned. The city is overwhelmed, struggling to cope with both the sheer numbers of people, but also implicitly the moral turpitude of some of its inhabitants, including, of course, Dr Jekyll. Indeed, the fog can be so pervasive that it can infiltrate houses, as seen in Jekyll's laboratory on the afternoon after the murder of Sir Danvers Carew. The numerous references to fog within London seem to me to serve a number of purposes. Firstly, they symbolise the cloudiness and confusion which surround Jekyll's relationship to Hyde, something which is only revealed towards the end of the novel. Secondly, they highlight the poor living conditions within this crowded and chaotic city. The air is polluted and there are rare spots of sunlight within this dark, depressing, decaying place. And finally, they help create a tense Gothic atmosphere, not dissimilar to Doyle's 1901 novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles, in which evil has the potential to flourish unseen, lurking in the gloom. Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde is a gothic text. There is the predominance of feelings of fear and horror. The use of the quasi-supernatural in Jekyll's creation of Mr Hyde and violent power imbalances between Hyde and Jekyll stroke innocent Londoners passing by. I've already highlighted the quantity and quality of fog drifting over London within a previous section. But more broadly, Stevenson uses references to an unsettled natural world to accentuate the tense atmosphere caused by uncertainty and horror over the actions of Hyde and the role of Jekyll. For instance, the morning after the death of Sir Danvers, Stevenson describes the first fog of the season. A great chocolate coloured pall lowered over heaven, but the wind was continually charging and routing these embattled vapours. Notice the conflict here and the intriguing use of the verbs charge and rout. The impression created is of nature at war, with the wind moving quickly and violently towards the stagnant fog, with the aim of breaking up wisps and dispersing. In a similar way, Stevenson describes conflict between wind and moon when Paul walks back to Jekyll's house, having fetched Utterson. The moon was lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her with flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. Here, in a similar way, the wind has figuratively tipped the moon onto one side, quite possibly after a charging and routing manoeuvre, leaving flying wreckages of flimsy cloud wisps in its wake. And note the similarly aggressive actions of the wind in the courtyard outside Jekyll's house, prior to Paul and Utterson breaking into the laboratory. The wind, which only broke in puffs and draughts into that deep well of building, tossed the light lighting of the candle to and fro about their steps. The scale is much smaller than the two previous examples, but nonetheless it is another example of pathetic fallacy in which the discord and conflict felt by human beings is reflected in the descriptions of the weather. Moreover, there is a sense of broader displeasure on the part of the natural elements, overseeing from afar Dr Jekyll's unnatural, evil machinations, something also seen in the quasi-masochistic flagellating trees in Jekyll's garden. There are, of course, very few women in the novel, although this is not the case in the numerous film versions. And it is partly due to this that speculation has arisen about whether any of the bachelors may have been partial to the occasional undercover homosexual liaison and partly due to conjecture about possible imagery and double entendres. For example, 
when discussing a weapon to use when breaking into Jekyll's laboratory, a phallic-like kitchen poker is suggested. It is notable that the two individual women referenced within the novel are portrayed relatively negatively. Most obviously, Hyde's landlady in Soho is described as having an evil face, smoothed by hypocrisy, but her manners were excellent. Additionally, she seems to de delight in the misfortune of others, or at least her tenant. After hearing that the man who wants to see his room is Inspector Newcomen of Scotland Yards, a flash of odious joy appeared upon the woman's face. Yes, this woman has only a very minor role, but the adjectives allow no room for doubt. She is simply evil and odious. The presentation of the maid who witnessed the murder of Sir Danvers Carew is superficially far more positive. However, it's worth scrutinising the apparently innocent description of her as romantically given. The only reason she appears in the text is because she was the sole witness to Hyde clubbing Carew to death. Within this context, the suggestion that she is romantically given becomes more problematic, as it implies that her judgment may be affected by her own love of reading romantic or sensation novels, and that her account may be coloured by her own desire to create her own narrative, provide her own background feelings, which would not be helpful for those investigating a case and looking for objectivity. Indeed, she certainly injects her narrative with a melodramatic air, which seems out of place given that she has witnessed or is claimed to witness an astonishingly brutal, bone-breaking, death-causing beating. Moreover, she ends up falling into the stereotype of the helpless, hysterical woman when, at the horror of these sights and sounds, she fainted. The paucity of women in the text and the fact that the few women are presented either negatively or as conforming to gender stereotypes has troubled critics over the years. It reinforces the impression we have of Stevenson's London as being a claustrophobically unhealthy place, chronically devoid of fulfilling relationships of any description. Even Utterson and Enfield don't particularly get on. Instead, loneliness permeates the lives of these superficially worthy gentlemen. some of which are forced to devise devious and elaborate schemes to inject joy and normality into their existences. Within his essay, The Victorian Frame of Mind, Walter Houghton writes this about the Victorians. Of all the criticisms brought against them by the Lytton Strachys of the 20th century, the Victorians would have pleaded guilty to only one. They would have defended or excused their optimism, their dogmatism, their appeal to force, their straight-laced morality, but they would have confessed to an unfortunate strain of hypocrisy. One, they concealed or suppressed their true convictions and their natural tastes. They said the right thing or did the right thing. They sacrificed sincerity to propriety. Second and worse, they pretended to be better than they were. They talked noble sentiments and lived quite otherwise. Finally, they refused to look at life candidly. They shut their eyes to whatever was ugly or unpleasant and pretended it didn't exist. Conformity, moral pretension and evasion, those are the hallmarks of Victorian hypocrisy. So much of this rings true in Stevenson's novel. Victorians concealed or suppressed their true convictions and natural tastes. As well as Jekyll hiding his uh, irregularities with an almost morbid sense of shame prior to creating Hyde 
and Utterson's monstrously self-denying lifestyle, Sir Danvers Carew and Enfield's late night activities can never be revealed by the narrator and are left unquestioned by others. Victorians like to pretend to be better than they were. This is seen in Jekyll's frantic do-gooding following a particularly evil occurrence involving Hyde. And his imperious desire to carry his head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. Victorians shut their eyes to whatever was ugly or unpleasant and pretended it didn't exist. Throughout the novel, Utterson feels desperately awkward getting involved in the strange case and so tries to limit his involvement as much as circumstances and his conscience allows. Following the death of Dr. Lanyon, he receives a mysterious letter, which is not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson, like a good Victorian, manages to hold down his curiosity and respect his friend's wishes. However, the narrator notes that it may be doubted if from that day forth Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. In other words, the Victorian conservatism and constraint within Utterson feels relieved that his visits to Jekyll are now almost invariably being denied. It means that, for the time being at least, he no longer needs to be exposed to strange, disturbing, almost certainly ugly and unpleasant goings on. The broader question is why Victorians in particular were so averse to ugliness and unpleasantness. One reason implied within the novel is that they were worried about the public scandal that could ensue as a result of being caught up in something deemed inappropriate or undesirable. When Hyde is accosted following his child trampling, Enfield and the rest of the indignant mob knew that killing him would be out of the question and so did the next best thing. We told the man we could and would make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. The hierarchy is revealing here. Some of us might feel that the next worst thing to being killed might be losing our job, losing a loved one or suffering from a terrible illness, say. Not so for the Victorians in which very little is worse than being embroiled in any kind of scandal. In the subsequent chapter, note the extraordinary image used to describe involvement in a scandal. Worried about Jekyll's link to Hyde, Utterson is fearful of the cancer of some concealed disgrace. This metaphor links shameful public exposure with a life-threatening, corrosive illness that can slowly eat away and rip apart internal organs, leaving a skeletal and devoid of energy. Cancer, sadly, rarely goes away permanently. And so this image also implies that Victorians felt that a scandal could leave a permanent stain on a per person's life. So much so that in some cases, a change of name is required to facilitate a fresh start. Another revealing image is used within the incident of the letter. After leaving Jekyll's house, Utterson's thoughts are far more about his old friend's reputation rather than Sir Danvers or doing the right thing morally. Utterson worries. He could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. An eddy is a small whirlpool that runs contrary to the direction of a tide or current. This image emphasises just how terrifyingly quickly a good name can be lost. It can figuratively take seconds 
for a lifetime of good works, respectable behaviour and good decorum to be obliterated within a spinning, sucking whirlpool, hell-bent on draining reputations away as quickly as possible. This viewpoint is very different, of course, to our society today, in which most of us feel that scandals typically blow over and are largely forgotten after a month or so. And so perhaps an understanding of the critical importance of an unblemished reputation for the Victorians may help us judge Jekyll more fairly. For instance, Utterson goes to visit Hyde following the death of Sir Danvers Carew and asks him whether he has heard the news. The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. As modern readers, we may be tempted to see the failure to make any quasi-sympathetic comment about poor Sir Danvers Carew shocking and heartless. However, it is possible to gauge the extent to which scandals might become terrifyingly all-consuming from Jekyll's words and actions. He cannot stop himself from shaking momentarily. Whilst the cries of newspaper sellers and citizens gleefully caught up in the excitement are so loud that they can be heard through the walls and windows of his house. Perhaps only Victorians can appreciate just how life-changing event a scandal could be. With this perspective, Jekyll's fear and apparent lack of remorse become slightly more understandable. The novel also shows how Victorians prioritise privacy and social boundaries far more than contemporary society. Thus, when Jekyll tells Utterson that the matter of the will and his relationship with Hyde's is a private matter and I beg of you to let it sleep, Utterson has no choice whatsoever but to cease his reluctant, out of character, protesting, questioning until Paul pitches up at his house, citing a possible murder within Jekyll's laboratory. This has been your ultimate revision guide for Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I hope it's been useful. Many thanks for watching. Schofield on Shakespeare.